Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 5 It will be generally admitted that Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is the most sublime noise that has ever penetrated into the ear of man. All sorts and conditions are satisfied by it. Whether you are like Mrs. Munt, and tap surreptitiously when the tunes come, of course not so as to disturb the others, or like Helen, who can see heroes and shipwrecks in the music's flood, or like Margaret, who can only see the music, or like Tibby, who is profoundly versed in counterpoint, and holds the full score open on his knee, or like their cousin, Fräulein Mosebach, who remembers all the time that Beethoven is echt Deutsch, or like Fräulein Mosebach's young man, who can remember nothing but Fräulein Mosebach. In any case, the passion of your life becomes more vivid, and you are bound to admit that such a noise is cheap at two shillings. It is cheap even if you hear it in the Queen's Hall, dreariest music-room in London, though not as dreary as the Free Trade Hall, Manchester, and even if you sit on the extreme left of that hall, so that the brass bumps at you before the rest of the orchestra arrives, it is still cheap. "'Who is Margaret talking to?' said Mrs. Munt, at the conclusion of the first movement. She was again in London on a visit to Wickham Place. Helen looked down the long line of their party, and said that she did not know. "'Would it be some young man or other whom she takes an interest in?' "'I expect so,' Helen replied. Music enwrapped her, and she could not enter into the distinction that divides young men whom one takes an interest in from young men whom one knows." "'You girls are so wonderful in always having—oh, dear, one mustn't talk.' For the andante had begun, very beautiful, but bearing a family likeness to all the other beautiful andantes that Beethoven had written, and to Helen's mind rather disconnecting the heroes and shipwrecks of the first movement from the heroes and goblins of the third. She heard the tune through once, and then her attention wandered— and she gazed at the audience, or the organ, or the architecture. Much did she censure the attenuated cupids who encircled the ceiling of the Queen's Hall, inclining each to each with vapid gesture, and clad in sallow pantaloons on which the October sunlight struck. "'How awful to marry a man like those cupids!' thought Helen. Here Beethoven started decorating his tune, so she heard him through once more, and then she smiled at her cousin Frida. But Frida, listening to classical music, could not respond. Herr Lysik, too, looked as if wild horses could not make him inattentive. There were lines across his forehead. His lips were parted, his pince-nez at right angles to his nose, and he had laid a thick white hand on either knee. And next to her was Aunt Julie, so British and wanting to tap. How interesting that row of people was! What diverse influences had gone to the making— here Beethoven, after humming and hawing with great sweetness, said, Hey-ho, and the andante came to an end. Applause, and a round of Wunderschöning and Prachtvolleying from the German contingent. Margaret started talking to her new young man. Helen said to her aunt, Now comes the wonderful movement. First of all the goblins, and then a trio of elephants dancing and Tibby implored the company generally to look out for the transitional passage on the drum. "'On the what, dear?' "'On the drum, Aunt Julie.' "'No, look out for the part where you think you have done with the goblins, and they come back,' breathed Helen, as the music started with the goblin walking quietly over the universe from end to end. Others followed him. They were not aggressive creatures. It was that that made them so terrible to Helen.' They merely observed in passing that there was no such thing as splendor or heroism in the world. After the interlude of elephants dancing, they returned, and made the observation for the second time. Helen could not contradict them, for once, at all events, she had felt the same, and had seen the reliable walls of youth collapse. Panic and emptiness. Panic and emptiness. The goblins were right. Her brother raised his finger. It was the transitional passage on the drum. For, as if things were going too far, Beethoven took hold of the goblins and made them do what he wanted, 
he appeared in person. He gave them a little push, and they began to walk in major key instead of in minor, and then he blew with his mouth and they were scattered. Gusts of splendor, gods and demigods contending with vast swords, color and fragrance broadcast on the field of battle, magnificent victory, magnificent death. Oh, it all burst before the girl, and she even stretched out her gloved hands as if it was tangible. Any fate was titanic, any conquest desirable. Conqueror and conquered would alike be applauded by the angels of the utmost stars. And the goblins? They had not really been there at all. They were only the phantoms of cowardice and unbelief. One healthy human impulse would dispel them. Men like the Wilcoxes, or President Roosevelt, would say yes. Beethoven knew better. The goblins really had been there. They might return, and they did. It was as if the splendor of life might boil over and waste to steam and froth. In its dissolution one heard the terrible, ominous note, and a goblin, with increased malignity, walked quietly over the universe from end to end. Panic and emptiness, panic and emptiness, even the flaming ramparts of the world might fall. Beethoven chose to make all right in the end. He built the ramparts up. He blew with his mouth for the second time, and again the goblins were scattered. He brought back the gusts of splendor, the heroism, the youth, the magnificence of life and of death, and amid vast roarings of a superhuman joy, he led his fifth symphony to its conclusion. But the goblins were there. They could return. He had said so bravely, and that is why one can trust Beethoven when he says other things. Helen pushed her way out during the applause. She desired to be alone. The music summed up to her all that had happened or could happen in her career. She read it as a tangible statement, which could never be superseded. The notes meant this and that to her, and they could have no other meaning, and life could have no other meaning. She pushed right out of the building, and walked slowly down the outside staircase, breathing the autumnal air, and then she strolled home. "'Margaret!' called Mrs. Munt. Is Helen all right? Oh, yes. She is always going away in the middle of a program, said Tibby. The music has evidently moved her deeply, said Fräulein Mosebach. Excuse me, said Margaret's young man, who had for some time been preparing a sentence, but that lady has, uh, quite inadvertently, taken my umbrella. "'Oh, good gracious me! I am so sorry. Uh, "'Tibby, run after Helen. "'I shall miss the four serious songs if I do. "'Tibby, love, you must go.' "'It isn't of any consequence,' said the young man, "'in truth a little uneasy about his umbrella. "'But of course it is. "'Tibby! Oh, Tibby!' "'Tibby rose to his feet and willfully caught his person on the backs of the chairs.' By the time he had tipped up the seat and found his hat, and had deposited his full score in safety, it was too late to go after Helen. The four serious songs had begun, and one could not move during their performance. "'My sister is so careless,' whispered Margaret. "'Not at all,' replied the young man, but his voice was dead and cold. "'If you would give me your address—' "'Oh, not at all.' Not at all. And he wrapped his greatcoat over his knees. Then the four serious songs rang shallow in Margaret's ears. Brahms, for all his grumbling and grizzling, had never guessed what it felt like to be suspected of stealing an umbrella. For this fool of a young man thought that she and Helen and Tibby had been playing the confidence trick on him, and that if he gave his address they would break into his room some midnight or other and steal his walking stick, too. Most ladies would have laughed— but Margaret really minded, for it gave her a glimpse into squalor. To trust people is a luxury in which only the wealthy can indulge. The poor cannot afford it. As soon as Brahms had grunted himself out, she gave him her card and said, "'That is where we live. If you preferred, you could call for the umbrella after the concert. 
But I didn't like to trouble you when it has all been our fault. His face brightened a little when he saw that Wickham Place was W. It was sad to see him corroded with suspicion, and yet not daring to be impolite, in case these well-dressed people were honest after all. She took it as a good sign that he said to her, "'It's a fine programme this afternoon, is it not?' For this was the remark with which he had originally opened, before the umbrella intervened. "'The Beethoven's fine,' said Margaret, who was not a female of the encouraging type. "'I don't like the Brahms, though, nor the Mendelssohn that came first, and, ugh, I don't like this Elgar that's coming.' "'What, what?' called Herr Liesick, overhearing. "'The pomp and circumstance will not be fine.' "'Oh, Margaret, you tiresome girl!' cried her aunt. "'Here I have been persuading Herr Liesick to stop for pomp and circumstance, and you are undoing all my work. I am so anxious for him to hear what we are doing in music. Oh, you mustn't run down our English composers, Margaret.' "'For my part, I have heard the composition at Stettin,' said Fräulein Mosbach. On two occasions. It is dramatic. A little. Frida, you despise English music. You know you do. And English art and English literature. Except Shakespeare. And he's a German. <laughs> Very well, Frida, you may go. The lovers laughed and glanced at each other. Moved by a common impulse, they rose to their feet and fled from pomp and circumstance. "'We have this call to pay in Finsbury Circus, it is true,' said Herr Liesick, as he edged past her and reached the gangway just as the music started. "'Margaret!' loudly whispered by Aunt Julie. "'Margaret! Margaret! Fräulein Mausebach has left her beautiful little bag behind her on the seat.' Sure enough, there was Frida's reticule, containing her address book, her pocket dictionary, her map of London, and her money." "'Oh, what a bother! What a family we are! F Frida!' "'Hush!' said all those who thought the music fine. "'But it's the number they want in Finsbury Circus.' "'Might I? Couldn't I?' said the suspicious young man, and got very red. "'Oh, I would be so grateful!' He took the bag, money clinking inside it, and slipped up the gangway with it. He was just in time to catch them at the swing door, and he received a pretty smile from the German girl, and a fine bow from her cavalier. He returned to his seat upsides with the world. The trust that they had reposed in him was trivial, but he felt that it cancelled his mistrust for them, and that probably he would not be had over his umbrella. This young man had been had in the past, badly, perhaps overwhelmingly, and now most of his energies went in defending himself against the unknown. But this afternoon, perhaps on account of music, he perceived that one must slack off occasionally, or what is the good of being alive? Wickham Place, W., though a risk, was as safe as most things, and he would risk it. So when the concert was over and Margaret said, "'We live quite near. I am going there now. "'Could you walk around with me, and we'll find your umbrella?' He said, "'Thank you.' peaceably, and followed her out of the Queen's Hall. She wished that he was not so anxious to hand a lady downstairs, or to carry a lady's program for her. His class was near enough her own for its manners to vex her. But she found him interesting on the whole. Everyone interested the Schlegels on the whole at that time. And while her lips talked culture, her heart was planning to invite him to tea. "'How tired one gets after music,' she began." Do you find the atmosphere of Queen's Hall oppressive? Yes, horribly. But surely the atmosphere of Covent Garden is even more oppressive. Do you go there much? When my work permits, I attend the gallery for the Royal Opera. Helen would have exclaimed, So do I! I love the gallery! And thus have endeared herself to the young man. Helen could do these things. But Margaret had an almost morbid horror of drawing people out, of making things go. She had been to the gallery at Covent Garden, but she did not attend it, preferring the more expensive seats, still less did she love it. So she made no reply. This year I have been three times, 
to Faust, Tosca, and was it Tannhauser or Tannhäuser? Better not risk the word. Margaret disliked Tosca and Faust, and so for one reason and another they walked on in silence, chaperoned by the voice of Mrs. Munt, who was getting into difficulties with her nephew. I do, in a way, remember the passage, Tibby. But when every instrument is so beautiful, it is difficult to pick out one thing rather than another. I am sure that you and Helen take me to the very nicest concerts, not a dull note from beginning to end. I only wish that our German friends would have stayed till it finished. But surely you haven't forgotten the drums steadily beating on the low C, Aunt Julie? Came Tibby's voice. No one could. It's unmistakable. A specially loud part," hazarded Mrs. Munt. "Of course, I do not go in for being musical," she added, the shot failing. "I only care for music, a very different thing. But still, I will say this for myself: I do know when I like a thing and when I don't. Some people are the same about pictures. They can go into a picture gallery, Miss Conder can, and say straight off what they feel all round the wall." I never could do that, but music is so different to pictures, to my mind. When it comes to music, I am as safe as houses, and I assure you, Tibby, I am by no means pleased by everything. There was a thing,、uh, something about a fawn in French, which Helen went into ecstasies over, but I thought it most tinkling and superficial, and said so, and I held to my opinion too. Do you agree? Asked Margaret. Do you think music is so different to pictures? I, I should have thought so, kind of," he said. "So should I. Now my sister declares they're just the same. We have great arguments over it. She says I'm dense. I say she's sloppy. Getting under way, she cried. Now doesn't it seem absurd to you? What is the good of the arts if they are interchangeable? What is the good of the ear if it tells you the same as the eye? Helen's one aim is to translate tunes into the language of painting, and pictures into the language of music. It's very ingenious, and she says several pretty things in the process. But what's gained? I'd like to know. Oh, it's all rubbish, radically false. If Monet's really Debussy and Debussy's really Monet, neither gentleman is worth his salt. That's my opinion. Evidently, these sisters quarrelled. Now, this very symphony that we've just been having, she won't let it alone. She labels it with meanings from start to finish, turns it into literature. I wonder if the day will ever return when music will be treated as music. Yet I don't know. There's my brother behind us. He treats music as music, and oh my goodness, he makes me angrier than any one. Simply furious. With him, I daren't even argue. An unhappy family, if talented, but of course the real villain is Wagner. He has done more than any man in the nineteenth century towards the muddling of arts. I do feel that music is in a very serious state just now, though extraordinarily interesting. Every now and then in history there do come these terrible geniuses like Wagner, who stir up all the wells of thought at once. For a moment it's splendid, such a splash as never was. But afterwards, such a lot of mud in the wells, as it were. They communicate with each other too easily now, and not one of them will run quite clear. That's what Wagner's done. Her speeches fluttered away from the young man like birds. If only he could talk like this, he would have caught the world. Oh, to acquire culture! Oh, to pronounce foreign names correctly! Oh, to be well informed, discoursing at ease on every subject that a lady started. But it would take one years. With an hour at lunch and a few shattered hours in the evening, how was it possible to catch up with leisured women who had been reading steadily from childhood? His brain might be full of names. He might have even heard of Monet and Debussy. The trouble was that he could not string them together into a sentence. He could not make them tell. He could not quite forget about his stolen umbrella. Yes. The umbrella was the real trouble. Behind Monet and Debussy, the umbrella persisted with the steady beat of a drum. I suppose my umbrella will be all right, he was thinking. I don't really mind about it. I will think about music instead. 
I suppose my umbrella will be all right. Earlier in the afternoon he had worried about seats. Ought he to have paid as much as two shillings? Earlier still he had wondered, shall I try to do without a program? There had always been something to worry him ever since he could remember, always something that distracted him in the pursuit of beauty. For he did pursue beauty, and therefore Margaret's speeches did flutter away from him like birds. Margaret talked ahead, occasionally saying, "'Don't you think so? Don't you feel the same?' And once she stopped and said, "'Oh, do interrupt me!' which terrified him. She did not attract him, though she filled him with awe. Her figure was meagre, her face seemed all teeth and eyes, her references to her sister and brother were uncharitable. For all her cleverness and culture, she was probably one of those soulless, atheistical women who have been so shown up by Miss Corelli. It was surprising, and alarming, that she should suddenly say, "'I do hope that you'll come in and have some tea.' "'I do hope that you'll come in and have some tea. We should be so glad. I have dragged you so far out of your way.' They had arrived at Wickham Place. The sun had set, and the backwater, in deep shadow, was filling with a gentle haze. To the right of the fantastic skyline of the flats towered black against the hues of evening. To the left the older houses raised a square-cut, irregular parapet against the grey. Margaret fumbled for her latch-key. Of course she had forgotten it. So grasping her umbrella by its ferrule, she leant over the area and tapped the dining-room window. "'Helen! Let us in!' "'All right!' said a voice. "'You've been taking this gentleman's umbrella!' "'Taken a what?' said Helen, opening the door. "'Oh, what's that? Oh, do come in. How do you do?' "'Helen, you must not be so ramshackly. You took this gentleman's umbrella away from Queen's Hall, and he has had the trouble of coming for it.' "'Oh, I am so sorry!' cried Helen, all her hair flying. She had pulled off her hat as soon as she returned, and had flung herself into the big dining-room chair. "'I do nothing but steal umbrellas. I am so very sorry. Do come in and choose one. Is yours a hooky or a nobly? Mine's a nobly. At least, I think it is.' The light was turned on, and they began to search the hall, Helen, who had abruptly parted with the Fifth Symphony, commenting with shrill little cries. "'Don't you talk, Meg!' "'You stole an old gentleman's silk-top hat.' "'Yes, she did, Aunt Julie. It is a positive fact. She thought it was a muff. "'Oh, heavens! I have knocked the in-and-out card down. "'Where's Frida? "'Tibby, why don't you ever—' "'No, I can't remember what I was going to say. "'That wasn't it. But do tell the maids to hurry tea up. "'What about this umbrella?' She opened it. "'No, it's all gone along the seams.' It's an appalling umbrella, it must be mine. But it was not. He took it from her, murmured a few words of thanks, and then fled with the lilting step of the clerk. But if you will stop, cried Margaret. Now, Helen, how stupid you've been. Whatever have I done? Don't you see that you frightened him away? I meant him to stop to tea. You oughtn't to talk about stealing or holes in an umbrella— I saw his nice eyes getting so miserable. No, it's not a bit of good now. For Helen had darted into the street, shouting, Oh, do stop! I dare say it is all for the best, opined Mrs. Munt. We know nothing about the young man, Margaret, and your drawing-room is full of very tempting little things. But Helen cried, Aunt Julie, how can you? You make me more and more ashamed— I'd rather he had been a thief and taken all the apostle spoons than that I— Well, I must shut the front door, I suppose. One more failure for Helen. Yes, I think the apostle spoons could have gone as rent, said Margaret. Seeing that her aunt did not understand, she added, You remember rent. It was one of father's words, rent to the ideal, to his own faith in human nature. You remember how he would trust strangers, and if they fooled him he would say— it's better to be fooled than to be suspicious. That the confidence trick is the work of the man, but the want of confidence trick is the work of the devil. "'I remember something of the sort now,' said Mrs. Munt, rather tartly, for she longed to add, "'It was lucky that her father married a wife with money.' 
but this was unkind, and she contented herself with, "'Why, he might have stolen the little Ricketts picture as well!' "'Better that he had,' said Helen stoutly. "'No, I agree with Aunt Julie,' said Margaret. "'I'd rather mistrust people than lose my little Ricketts. There are limits.' Their brother, finding the incident commonplace, had stolen upstairs to see whether there were scones for tea. He warmed the teapot almost too deftly, rejected the orange pico that the parlour-maid had provided, poured in five spoonfuls of a superior blend, filled up with a really boiling water, and now called to the ladies to be quick or they would lose the aroma. "'All right, Auntie Tibby,' called Helen, while Margaret, thoughtful again, said, "'In a way, I wish we had a real boy in the house, the kind of boy who cares for men. It would make entertaining so much easier.' "'So do I,' said her sister. "'Tibby only cares for cultured females singing Brahms.' And when they joined him, she said rather sharply, "'Why didn't you make that young man welcome, Tibby? He must do the host a little, you know. You ought to have taken his hat and coaxed him into stopping, instead of letting him be swamped by screaming women.' Tibby sighed and drew a long strand of hair over his forehead. "'Oh, it's no good-looking superior. I mean what I say.' Oh, "'Leave Tibby alone,' said Margaret, who could not bear her brother to be scolded. "'Here's the house a regular hen-coop,' grumbled Helen. "'Oh, my dear,' protested Mrs. Munt, "'how can you say such dreadful things? The number of men you get here has always astonished me.' If there is any danger, it's the other way round. Yes, but it's the wrong sort of men, Helen means. No, I don't, corrected Helen. We get the right sort of man, but the wrong side of him. And I say that's Tibby's fault. There ought to be a something about the house, and I don't know what. A touch of the W's, perhaps? Helen put out her tongue. Who are the W's? asked Tibby. The W's are things I and Meg and Aunt Judy know about, and you don't, so there. I suppose that ours is a female house, said Margaret, and one must just accept it. No, Aunt Judy, I don't mean that this house is full of women. I am trying to say something much more clever. I mean that it was irrevocably feminine, even in father's time. Now I'm sure you understand. Well, I'll give you another example. It'll shock you, but I don't care. Suppose Queen Victoria gave a dinner party, and that the guests had been Leighton, Millet, Swinburne, Rossetti, Meredith, Fitzgerald, etc. Do you suppose that the atmosphere of that dinner would have been artistic? Heavens, no! The very chairs on which they sat would have seen to that. So with our house. It must be feminine, and all we can do is to see that it isn't effeminate. Just as another house that I can mention, but I won't, sounded irrevocably masculine, and all its inmates can do is to see that it isn't brutal. That house being the W's house, I presume, said Tibby. You're not going to be told about the W's, my child, Helen cried, so don't you think it. And on the other hand, I don't the least mind if you find out, so don't think you've done anything clever in either case. Give me a cigarette. "'You do what you can for the house,' said Margaret. "'The drawing-room reeks of smoke. "'If you smoked, too, the house might suddenly turn masculine. "'Atmosphere is probably a question of touch and go. "'Even at Queen Victoria's dinner-party, "'if something had been just a little different, "'perhaps if she'd worn a clinging Liberty tea-gown "'instead of a magenta satin, "'with an Indian shawl over her shoulders, "'fastened at the bosom with a cairngorm pin.' Bursts of disloyal laughter, you must remember that they are half German, greeted these suggestions, and Margaret said pensively, How inconceivable it would be if the royal family cared about art. And the conversation drifted away and away, and Helen's cigarette turned to a spot in the darkness, and the great flats opposite were sown with lighted windows, which vanished and were relit again, and vanished incessantly. Beyond them the thoroughfare roared gently, a tide that could never be quiet, while in the east, invisible behind the smokes of Wapping, the moon was rising. "'That reminds me, Margaret. We might have taken that young man into the dining-room at all events. Only the majolica plate, and that is so firmly set in the wall. 
I am really distressed that he had no tea. For that little incident had impressed the three women more than might be supposed. It remained as a goblin football, as a hint that all is not for the best in the best of all possible worlds, and that beneath these superstructures of wealth and art there wanders an ill-fed boy, who has recovered his umbrella indeed, but who has left no address behind him, and no name. End of chapter 5